Welcome to the podcast, everyone. This is the Grace Force podcast, and we're so excited to have uh, Sam Guzman here from Catholic Gentleman, and we'll get right to that, but we want to say a prayer first. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I learned that prayer, thrusting Satan into hell. <laughs> I always have to go casting because everybody does casting. It's great to have you, Sam. It's great to be here. Yeah. You, you know, um, Sam used to live in the area and uh, I saw him more often than I do now. So it's really good to see you. And it's uh, congratulations on your book, uh, amazing book. Um, and so that's what we want to do this first segment here is we want to take some time to, uh, to let Sam tell us, you know, what his book, here it is. I got it right here. Catholic Gentleman. Make sure you get it on Amazon.com. And I got it in this form and I got it in Kindle as well. So, um, but it's, it's, everybody's talking about it and it's an amazing book. And Sam, do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Well, it's uh, 30, 32 short chapters. Nice. Uh, each one dealing with uh, a different aspect of Catholic masculinity, either uh, manhood, what is it, what does it mean, how do we live in the modern world, uh, as well as uh, just the different reflections on the spiritual life and how to live it as a, as a Catholic man who is striving for sanctity and, and sainthood. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of everything, uh, a lot of different topics. Uh, people ask me sometimes, what age is it uh, best for? And I really don't, I, I mean, teenagers and up, <laughs> teenagers up to uh, geriatric, or octogenarians, definitely. let's put it that way. Definitely, definitely. You know, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's for everyone. I wrote it for everyone. So um, if you have a, a high school boy you're thinking of, or, there's a, your college age or whatever, I think uh, you'll find something that yeah. talks to you. So. Doug, pretty good yeah. book, huh? Oh, yeah. You know, and we need it. We need books like that. We This yeah. is a, it's a great one. And, you know, Sam, as we were saying before the show, you, you've you branded yourself and your whole approach with kind of this classic uh, imagery that comes out on your blog. Uh, and the book, of course, kind of reeks of that classic imagery and really the classic imagery of, of the nature of a man as well in the book. So I, it, it's definitely very needed. Um, what's the feedback been so far from people uh, who have uh, who've gotten the book, who've read it? I mean, what have you heard? I mean, I would say it's it's uh, the, the majority of the feedback has been positive. There's been a few people who have pointed out, well, this section could have been stronger or... You know, maybe a few even people who said, well, I wish you would have dived in a little deeper on some of these chapters because this is great stuff, but, you know, it's just very introductory in some ways. And honestly, that was kind of the approach because sure. that, that was intentional because there are some fantastic books out there that are a lot more lengthy. Uh, I think specifically of like um, Behold, Behold the Man by uh, Deacon Harold Berg Sivers, you know, a very lengthy, in-depth treatment of this issue. And there's other great ones. Um, they go go a little bit deeper, but I wanted something that was very introductory, something that would be very accessible for for anybody, um, but also that was substantive. So I tried to strike that balance between um, brevity and substance, and hopefully I hit the mark. But so far, the feedback has been mostly has been mostly positive. Well, what motivated you, Sam? I mean, in light of what we see in society, what's going on in the world. Was there anything in particular that struck you and said, you know what, I just, I got to get into this. I got to write this because we know that there's a problem in general with an understanding of what true manhood is, godly manhood, Catholic masculinity in general. What struck you and made you think, you know, I feel like the Holy Spirit's putting on my heart to write this book. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's uh, just lots of conversations that I've had with, with uh, young men, especially young men my age um, who you can just tell they have this desire to be a Catholic man of substance, you know, a man of integrity, a man of virtue, uh, a man who is, isn't just a show, you know, who's got this, there's something deeper there. But on the other hand, you look around and 
so many young men are lost. Like, what does that even look like anymore in this modern context? And we have, we're just inundated with, with images from, from media. And, and uh, just before the show, we were talking about the Gillette ad, you know, and, and, and how they were just kind of framing masculinity in a very specific way. Right. Um, and we're just kind of inundated with these messages that are always undermining, calling into question, sowing doubt and confusion. And, and so a lot of young men today, they're just, they don't even know what that looks like, despite that desire, that hunger in their heart to be an authentic man. There's just so few guides, so few people who um, are showing the way these days and really kind of holding up uh, an image of authentic manhood. And so I, I, my desire with the book, my, my kind of my heart's desire was to, to affirm that it is good to be a man. It is not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to kind of uh, hide about yourself or, or downplay. You know, when we look at so many of our young boys who are just kind of getting a pump full of powerful psychotropic drugs to kind of neutralize their boyishness, their masculinity that's kind of budding, um, you know, and it's, it's tragic. And so, in the face of so many voices that are saying manhood is illegitimate, I would say, no, God made men, God made men good. And it is good to be a man. And here's what a Catholic man looks like. And at least give some glimmer of hope to many of those confused men out there, young men, um, or, or sometimes not even so young men, but who are seeking something more, something of substance uh, that goes beyond the kind of shallow um, archetypes of manhood that our culture holds up. Uh, to us, um, which, which often are, are completely false. So. Yeah. You know, um, I, I love the book. First of all, if you haven't checked out uh, his website, Sam's website, it's amazing. Catholic net, isn't it? Yep. That's it. Dot net. And um, I have it uh, bookmarked, so I just click on it every time. <laughs> anyways, but anyways, uh, so uh, it's amazing. But what I noticed Sam, that you do a lot is that you, uh, and this is the word I use a lot, is that there's an intrigue with what is vintage, you know? And I see that in a lot, you use a lot of images and, and they're vintage uh, manhood. And even in your book, you, 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 uh, you, you start out by, uh, by talking about your love for hot rods or your, you know, your old cars that you love, the muscle cars, right? And, uh, and, and you kind of frame it that way, that you know, and you, and you tie that with uh, authentic manhood. Can you tell us what you were getting at with that? Yes. Well, okay. There's two two parts to what you said there, and I, th- I want to start with the first one: the the power of the image. Right. Um, human beings are natural imitators. We're we're natural born imitators, and um, a, a great uh, Catholic philosopher, Rene Girard, talks about this a lot. But he talks about the power of of an image that we want to imitate. We all have images that we want to imitate, whether or not we realize it or not. I mean, how else do you explain, you know, Michael Jordan, you know, in his, in this ad selling milk, you know, it's like, (laughs) you want to drink milk because you want to be Michael Jordan. Like that's just how we're made. And it's like, and, and if you're, you're cowboy type, you know, you want to be the marble man or the bull rider or whatever. Yeah. And then if you're in the, the military, you know, you want to be like the Navy right. SEAL or the, like we all have an image that we are subconsciously, sometimes unconsciously trying to imitate. Right. Um, and so media understand that advertisers, marketers, they understand this so well. But a lot of times we don't realize it. Right. So the question is like, what are you putting in front of you as your image what is that what are you filling your mind with um so first of all images are far more powerful than people um realize and i think that um you know you look at the catholic beauty that's kind of defined the church uh almost since the beginning um and uh, we wonder why people say well why why are you into catholic artwork and architecture and things like that because imagery matters it shapes us in ways that we don't even realize. Okay, so that's one thing. Images are incredibly powerful. So yes, the imagery in Catholic Gentleman is very intentional. But secondarily, the issue of authenticity. Why is that so important? Um, you know, you look at the, those old muscle cars we were talking about, you know, and I kind of start the book off talking about they're, there's, they're real. What you see is what you get. I mean, if there's 
a giant, you know, supercharger sticking out of the hood, it's real. It's really doing something. It's not just for show. It's not just, you know, a piece of plastic that's, you know, there to look tough. I was at the uh, car show in, in Milwaukee a year or two ago, and they had this giant, massive pickup truck there. Man, yeah. this thing looked aggressive. Man, this thing looked tough. And I went up and like start and tried to put the hood down and it was a piece of plastic. It was like, it was oh. a chrome painted piece of plastic. And it's like, oh. it's like, that's yeah. like a metaphor for the modern yeah. world. Like everything's just show. Everything's just a video yeah. and there's no substance there. And I yeah. feel like that also applies to modern manhood where it's like, yeah. man, I got big biceps and like, you know, watch UFC and like drink energy drinks and man, I'm a real man, you know? And it's like, no, you're, you could be an overgrown boy, no matter how big your biceps are. Like what's defining that? What's the substance? And oftentimes you don't see that until you're under pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think when we're in moments of crisis, <clears throat> moments of trial, what you really are comes to the surface. Right. Um, but, but the point being that, a lot of modern manhood is is substanceless. It's like yeah. this, you know, five hundred thousand dollar car, and all the you know doodads on it are all completely fake, and it's just a piece right. of glorified plastic. Where you look at some of these older cars, and there's substance there. It's real metal and exactly. and real wood, and and uh, that's a beautiful thing. So, um, really, we want to be those authentic men. We don't want to be the giant pickup truck with the chrome plastic right. hood. You know, we want to be the real man with with the, what you see is what you get there's no right. uh duplicity about it right yeah. yeah and and that comes out so much in the images that you use especially with uh you know the, these classic old guys and you always have a great quote that goes along with it i i always look forward to it you'll be on social media and all of a sudden this catholic gentleman image comes up with a great great powerful co quote um doug uh what do you think about that though, with the muscle cars and all that you know, I was thinking about this, you know, and I know we talked about this earlier today, Father. This is one of the areas we really wanted to address because that whole that whole explanation you just gave, Sam, and as you spell it out in your book, uh, is, I think, incredibly accurate. Uh, and I, I would think about also the fact that we've got a lot of our men today who are thinking that it's the tattoos or it's the hair, it's the, you know, the, the, even the jewelry. Uh, our athletes, uh, it, it, there's all these images out there that are uh, window dressing. It's a lot of window dressing, and it's not, it's not deep. There's no depth to it. You know, I mean, I've been lifting weights for 42 years. I started when I was 12, and, you know, one of the things I tell anybody I'm trying to help when it comes to training or lifting weights is you stick to the basics, you hammer it out, you have the good diet, you hit the weights, you hammer it out day by day over and over. And then some young guy comes up to me once in a while. Hey, Mr. Barry, I got these pills, you know, and oh, oh I, got a, I got a bottle of something here, you know, and if I just take these pills, I'm going to get the guns and the six pack abs and it's going to happen in six weeks. And I say, yeah, and then you'll lose them three weeks after you stop taking the pills. You want to stick with it. You want to have it for a long time. You want to have it for the rest of your life. You've got to build it the right way. It's got to be authentic. And, and it's got to be true and it's got to be down to the core, you know, and I think about that too. And you would talk about Sam, you talk about the, you know, the muscle cars in your right. I mean, you know, the, the old Chevy Chevelles or Camaros, or I think back even when I had a, like a 67 uh, Chevy blazer and it was a four by four and it was one of these vehicles that, uh, you know, it's four gallons to the mile, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things, but that thing would, was unstoppable. Um, and it was heavy and it was made of metal, but it was real. It was authentic. So I love the imagery of that because it does make the point. And it is one of the greatest problems we have. You know, any of the young guys I work with in high schools or, or confirmation retreats across the country, there's this, this window dressing, this superficial side. And I know it's, it's not just with the young. It's with uh, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. It's, uh, it's a big problem. And uh, something like this, you know, these, these, these uh, word pictures, metaphors, analogies, examples, like the cars you just talk about, Sam, are powerful because they do, they do reach the core of a man. You step on the gas pedal of one of those old muscle cars, ooh, mm -hmm. you, you feel something there. You know, mm -hmm. it's like the power of, of, of chambering around in a 12-gauge shotgun. There's just mm -hmm. something about the, the genuineness of that that men connect with. That's why I love you put that in the book because it really relates to where men are really at the core. 
Yeah. You know, I just want to say, um, I'm going to hold up Sam's book again, but I was telling Sam before we got started, I said, Sam, I'd really appreciate your writing style. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, you're, are you a fan of, uh, G GK Ch Chesterton? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. I'm going to compare you to him. No. <laughs> no, you have, but you know what it is about that though? There, there's a, uh, there's a liveliness about it. You know, you're just, your heart's kind of pumping while you're reading. And he's just a, a Sam's just a very, very good writer. Uh, so I really, really strongly encourage everybody, you know, pick this up or, or if you're a lady, pick it up for your man. But uh, this is a, this is a monumental work and I really appreciate it, Sam. So we're going to take a little break here. And when we come back, uh, we want to talk about what is meant by toxic masculinity. So we'll be right back. Hey, everyone, we're back. Welcome to the U.S. Grace Force podcast. I'm Doug Barry. We have Father Heilman, and our guest tonight is Sam Guzman. Sam, did I pronounce that right? Is it Sam or is it Sam? I mean, is it Guzman or is it Guzman? <laughs> <laughs> it's Guzman, yes. Guzman, okay. Hey, great to have you on the show. Our first segment, we talked, you know, imagery and so forth and muscle cars, love all that. Um, toxic masculinity, though, that's a very popular term being thrown around. We've been hearing a lot about it. And, of course, it's being thrown around in a very negative sense that it's bad to be toxically masculine. What do you get from that? And why do you think it's being used in society right now? I mean, obviously, by those who seem to be wanting to undermine true masculinity. What do you get from the term toxic masculinity? Why do you think they're, they're going after masculinity by using that term? Yeah, so I think, uh, I think there's a distinction that needs to be made because if you talk about toxic masculinity, what um, most people hear is that mis and what most people mean <laughs> is that masculinity itself is toxic. Right. Now, if you're, if you're genuinely mean that men at times can behave in toxic ways, right. then yes, I agree with you because there is a serious lack of virtue in our culture among right. modern men. And if you look right. at things like the hookup culture and things oh. like that, where, where it's like just men at kind of their lowest point, you know, just, just kind of, a, you know, almost like this animalistic predatory thing where they're right. just looking for you know, the easiest conquests and things like that. That's, women like objects. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Now, if that's what you mean, then men can behave in sometimes toxic and sinful ways. Then yes, mm -hmm. I agree with you. And what's the antidote to that? Virtuous masculinity. Okay. So if that's what you mean, th that virtuous man masculinity is the solution, then I agree with you. But what you find nine times out of 10, when somebody's throwing around the word toxic masculinity, what they're saying is manhood itself is toxic. And again, kind of going back to this Gillette ad, you do, the yeah. boy picks up a stick and pretends it's a sword or he starts wrestling or, you know, is in any way aggressive or in any way doing anything dangerous or playing, you know, cops and robbers or whatever, like, Oh man, toxic masculinity right there. We better neuter that guy with some drugs or something, you know, like just yeah. tamp it down, stamp yeah. it down, you know, get rid of it, you know, neutralize their boyishness. Like that is what that's toxic, you know, that's yep. masculine, so it's toxic, you know. And and honestly, that's that's wrong. You know, that that approach when you say that manhood in and of itself is toxic. And really what that means is femininity is the standard of all that's good and, and virtuous and, and righteous. And men need to conform to that standard, you know, and the minute they start being men, you know, the minute they start, uh, you know, shooting things or, <laughs> or, or driving too fast or like, no, no, I'm, or, I'm exaggerating. I'm exaggerating. Yeah. Or but, stand but next you, to you a know. grill. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, let's, let's, let's launch a, you know, $10 million ad campaign to, to, you know, stamp out this toxic masculinity here. But yeah. no, like, and, and it's completely wrong to illegitimize men in that way. And guess what it does? It just makes men angry and resentful and even more toxic. That's and it's, right. and it's, it's, it's tragic to watch the cycle perpetuate itself where men feel disenfranchised and illegitimized 
and that that makes them behave in even more foolish ways and then society's like hey see see we told you men are toxic you know and it's yeah. and it we've got to break that cycle we've got to get back to what's the antidote what's the solution virtuous manhood yeah um, that's the solution it's that's that raw yes masculine strength but it's brought under the control and the discipline of virtue um, and, you know, as Catholics, we, we know that this has to be aided by God's grace. Um, there is, there is kind of a stoic, you know, natural virtue that you can attain, but if we really want to take it to the next level, uh, we need supernatural virtue. Uh, and that's what we should be seeking. Awesome. You know, I, I, one of my favorite images of the Holy family is, uh, Joseph. He's got the reins of the donkeys walking out ahead. And there uh, on top of the donkey is Mary and she's pregnant with child. And it just, it strikes me because I think what you're seeing there is, you know, a servant leader. I, I love that. I love that expression of what, what um, uh, a husband, a father, a man is. He's a servant leader. And St. Joseph is just such a great model of that. Um, look what he does. Uh, he raises Mary up. Uh, you know, I always say, you know, people can tell me I'm wrong about this, but I don't believe I am. Women are sacred. I mean, we can't, we can't uh, produce a child in our belly, Sam or Doug, you know, they can, they're the tabernacle of new life. You know, uh, I was, uh, I was at a dinner with uh, some parishioners a couple of years ago and uh, the young kids and <clears throat> lots of boys and a couple of girls. And I said, uh, I told one of the girls, I said, do me a favor, just walk out in the kitchen real quick. And then I'll tell you when to come in. <clears throat> and so she did, I don't know, she was about uh, 13, 14 years old. And so I, and so while she was out in the kitchen, I, I, I whispered to the guys, I said, okay, now when she comes back in, we're all going to stand. Okay. And so she, uh, okay, come on in. And, and we all stood. That was something I saw relatively often when I was a kid, I saw men stand when a lady entered a room. And it, it, there was just this sense that, you know, okay, guys, you're the, you're the spiritual leader, sure. But what does that mean? You're the servant leader, okay? Somebody put it this way, and I, I, I tend to agree that men are like the CEO of the family, but women are, are the queen, right? Uh, and, and so that's how I was raised in that kind of environment. My mom cleaned dirty diapers, you know, and, and she cooked meals and, you know, uh, and, and all that stuff. But my dad never stopped treating her like a queen. And uh, so what do you think of that, Sam? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, that you look at uh, the way that women are treated now, and it's incredibly difficult to make the argument that it's an advancement. <laughs> the men have more respect for women now yeah. uh, than they did in the past. Like it's, right. it, you know, it's, it's disdain, you know, between the sexes. They, right. they both broadly speaking, you know, despise each other, <laughs> you right. know, at a cultural level. And, and you see this reflected in, in media. Uh, the way that that men are portrayed as as idiots, um, but but women just kind of condescendingly sneer at them, and so it's like we went from this culture of mutual respect right. of different roles right. to conflict and competition. Right. We went from a culture of cooperation to a culture of competition, and you know, and it's, it's an all out war now, you know, it's like, and then I went to a store the other day and there was some doodads, you know, uh, 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 bath towels and magnets and all this stuff. And then they all said the same message. The future is female. Yeah. And, and I, I was just thinking like, what a message, because what it really communicates is revenge. Like, yeah. You know, you, you've kept us down for so long. You've held us back. Well, now we're going to make you pay, men. The future is female. You know, we don't need you. Uh, you're irrelevant now. And, right. and I am woman, hear me roar. You know, and like this whole culture of, it's like revenge. It's like payback. Right. And, you know, I, I feel like 
but men likewise in our culture and, and this is tragic in itself too feel the same way about women the more they are sidelined the more they're you know uh criticized culture and things like that she's just with resentment so it's like this all-out war between men and women now and it's uh -huh. like it's tragic because you know it kind of goes back to the garden where it's like the part of that curse is like your desire will be to be your husband there's a confusing verse there or your desire will be to your husband but i think what that verse means is like your desire will be to be your husband in a sense uh -huh. like to you you know try to uh uh, be in, in conflict with him and to right. uh, be struggling for that that um, manly responsibility and things like that and and so I, I just I've seen the breakdown in our culture where there used to be mutual respect for the differences that made us men and for the differences that made us women and there was a beautiful kind of dance between the sexes there where right. there was a mutual interplay of giving and receiving in and yes, it, it wasn't perfect. We were still fallen and there was still abuse and there was still sin and there was still uh, failures there. Absolutely. You can't look at the past as like this golden age without sin. But at the same time, I do feel like there, as you were describing, uh, Father Elman, you know, just a huge culture uh, uh, of at least ritualized respect for right. women. That's what manners are is, is ritualized respect. Um, and, and I feel like that was something that was far more common in the past than it is now. Yeah. Sam, Sam, do you see the, the, um, the direction we've gone then? Um, and it sounds like this is kind of what you're saying that we we've gone this direction of almost revenge. Like you said, the future is female. And I've seen that too, in various places, this, this new campaign, well, isn't so new, but it's out there. But do you see that the pendulum maybe has swung? Cause you're right. We've, we've gotten, um, We've got a past where there are problems. Yes, just like there was racism, and we've had to deal with that, and that's that's still an ongoing issue in some some areas. But it was really really bad, you know, fifty, sixty, whatever years ago. Um, but we've we also have women were were treated differently. Now they can vote, and you know, different things have happened. But but it's as if there has been almost a diabolical attack on what needed to be done to correct some of those problems, to the point where now the only way to fix the problems of women being mistreated is to destroy men in some way. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that, that seems to be what we're seeing. Um, not what you're saying that we all grow in virtue and try to find that beautiful complementary nature between men and women. And father back to your point too, Cardinal Manzenti made it clear that, you know, angels can't even do what women are capable of doing, you know, growing a child in the womb that's has, that has the image and likeness of God you know, breathed into that child at the moment of conception. Um, so, so Sam, you know, in your opinion, since you are, you know, the expert, you've written a book on it. You must be an expert, right? Is that how that works now? So you're, yeah, yeah. all my statements are ex cathedra. There you uh, go. Exactly. <laughs> That's what we needed to hear. <laughs> We're going to promote the show with that very statement you just made. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but tell us in your opinion, what would, what, what, what do you think needs to happen? If we're gonna find that that proper balance, that proper complementary man woman virtue exchange, so we can try to, you know, you know, arrest or subdue this attack that is really just undermine and destroy manhood. Yeah. Uh, just, it's, it's, a, it's a simple question, Sam. No, no, no. What do we, how do we fix it? So I, but really, I mean, I, there's something I've thought about and I, I do think that there are several parallel things that need to happen. But first and foremost, I think young men need to get dead serious about discerning their vocation. And if that means becoming a priest, you know, thanks be to God, we need holy priests. Um, absolutely, like it's an urgent need right now. But if you're called to marriage, take that dead seriously. I think a lot of young men are like, well, I've ruled out the priesthood. So I'll just meander around for the next 10 years, you know, doing who knows what, uh, while I figure out what I'm going to do with my life, you know? And it's like, no, if you've ruled out religious life or, or the priesthood, okay, then get serious about getting married. You know, you have your eye on a girl. Don't just passive aggressively, just kind of, 
get to know her and just be friends. No, ask her out. Like, get intentional about this. I'm going to get married. I'm going to, and you know, like, well, I'm not ready yet. Well, you're never going to be ready. You know, prepare yourself as much as possible. But marriage is one of those things that the only thing that can really prepare you to be married is marriage. Like, you're just going to have to jump at some point. And I, as for me, like, I got married and I was incredibly immature. And I found that out very fast, even though. I read all these books on marriage and listened to all these talks and I thought I was going to be like the world's greatest husband. But then I got married and found out that I was like the world's worst husband. But it's like, you know what? Just get started. Just do it. Right. You know, and, and that God, I think, blesses that intentionality. I'm not saying be utterly reckless. Okay. Commit your way to the Lord. Give it prayer. But then act. I think for so many young Catholic men that I've encountered, yeah. discernment becomes an excuse for inaction. Well, I'm discerning. Well, what does that even mean? What are you waiting for? Boy, Sam, I got to say, I agree with that so much. <laughs> so many guys out there. Oh, no, I'm just prayerfully discerning. Yeah, but you're 47. What, <laughs> what do you, what, I mean, you know, your gravestone's going to read, here lies so-and-so still discerning. I mean, it's... It, <laughs> Right. Sorry to cut you off there, but I just had to. You're absolutely right with yeah. that one. I've run into the same thing with a lot of guys. Well, I'm just not sure yet. Yeah. And, start moving towards something. Well, hey, and there's guys. all these beautiful young Catholic girls out there. They're like, oh, I just want to get married and be a wife and mother. And they're like, I can't find a guy. And there's all these guys out there. They're like, well, I'm just discerning. And it's like, oh, like just do yeah, something. Yeah, you know? yeah. So yeah. You know, we, uh, let, let's, let's, let's save some of this. Go ahead. I got, you got me pa impassioned here. So <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So let's save this um, for uh, we're building up great because this is what we wanted to talk about in our last segment. So uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. And we got uh, Sam Guzman with us, Doug Berry, and myself. And uh, this has been great, you guys. Uh, so uh, this last segment now we really uh, we, we call it gentlemen start your engines you know remember we were talking earlier in the podcast about um, about the old cars and uh, and how genuine authentic they are and and, and rugged um, so we kind of chose this topic to say okay where do we go from here you know what what do we do you know how do we become the gentleman we're called to be and Sam I know you hit that in the book you want you want to help us with that? Yeah, well, I think part of um, grown, becoming a man, uh, I think there has to be a transition from, clear transition from boyhood to manhood. Right. And I think what we see with a lot of men today is that biologically, you know, they're men, but they've never really made that emotional, spiritual, psychological transition to masculinity. And I think there's a, there's a good friend of mine, uh, Jason Craig, who wrote a wonderful book about this. Um, but he, it, it's all about those kind of that, that transition from boyhood to manhood and how that happens. And so I strongly recommend it. Um, uh, J Jason Craig is his name here. And, uh, but the, the point is that there has to be kind of a death to that old self and the birth of someone new. And that, Transition happens when you step out into the dangerous unknown, you know, right. and, and face a challenge and right. overcome it and right. test yourself, improve yourself. And, you know, again, all traditional societies for the most part had rituals where a boy would kind of be ritually put in this situation. You know, even some cultures, they'd send him out into the desert with no food or water for right. a week and they had to figure out how to survive. You come through an experience like that, there's no doubt in your mind that you're a man. Like someone calls that into question and you, you have that confidence. You say, hey, I passed the test. You yeah. don't have to question. You don't have to doubt. I think what a lot of men say, feel today is because they've never been through an experience like that or they've never been told, you know, they've never felt that they've really arrived, right. that uh, they have to kind of compensate with, the big muscles and the tattoos and the, you know, hip hairstyles and, you know, the womanizing and things like that, because to them, that's like, that's all that manhood needs. But, but ultimately you have to face yourself and you have to face danger and you have to face the unknown and you have to overcome it. That's why one of the few places left in our culture where this still happens is the military. You're leaving home, 
you're joining the military, you're going through boot camp, they're kind of breaking down the old you, building up the new you, and you come out a man, you know, and that's why I think there's still a great respect for uh, military men in our culture today. Um, and that's how it should be. But um, that's one of the few places in our culture where this, this still happens in a kind of a consistent way. But the point is we need kind of that transition. And I think that's the foundation. That's kind of how we enter into manhood. Now, once you are a man, then you need to become a gentleman. And that's where that virtue and that masculine refinement comes in to play where we all can think of men probably who we know who are huge, you know, powerful men, whether that's physically or intellectually or just CEOs that are powerful, that wield a lot of influence, you know, politicians, whatever. And yet there's just something off there. They manipulate people. They, they're selfish. They're self-seeking. They're, they, they use people as a means to an end. Um, or maybe they're just a jerk or they're just arrogant or they don't care about other, all those things where it's like, okay, they've got that ma masculine power, but it's not channeled. It's not controlled. It's not oriented towards the good of others. Um, they're not sermons and, right. and they're more in it for themselves than they are for the good of others. And uh, that's what separates a man from a gentleman. I would say is that, that refinement and that orientation towards the good of others uh, and, and through servant leadership. Strength is for service. Right. Uh, and, and Christ showed that profoundly at the last supper when he stripped off his garments, <clears throat> kind of symbolically laying aside his messianic power. Right. He humbled himself and his Philippians says, took on the form of a servant, you know, and, and, and he, he washed our feet and he said that, do you understand what I've done to you? You know, I've set aside my power and I have humbled myself. That's what true manhood is. That's what true power is, is found in that service and, and in that laying your life down for the good of others. Right. And that's a difficult thing to do, um, but it's what we're called to. You, you're, you know, you're going to be a great dad. Uh, you are a great dad, but I'm, I say uh, future tense because your kids are little now. And uh, as they grow older, um, you know, you're going to be able to give them all these tools and all this great wisdom. Doug, your kids are older and I've been watching you dad for many years. <laughs> You've got some amazing kids and I've, I've been in awe just watching you, uh, and raise these, these, uh, these, these children of yours. And what, what do you think about what, what Sam's saying here? I, I think you'd agree, right? I do, uh, especially with, uh, and thank you for the compliment father and God willing, you know, you know, my wife and I've tried to raise some, some good adults and, uh, from kids and we're very, very thankful. They've been, uh, so far so good. They yeah. worked out really wonderfully. One of them sitting right next to me here. He's, he's nice. helped produce this show on this end of it. And he, he does a fantastic job, but, but no, I, I, Sam, when you talk about that kind of rite of passage thing, you know, and I, it's been skewed in so many ways in today's <laughs> world where people think the rite of passage is simply something, uh, like for example, it's predominantly sports, you know, and if we, yeah. you know, and, and while there may be an element of that there, there's something really different about what you describe that goes deeper uh, because it has to be overcoming things that don't have a glory attached to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the football field, the basketball court, you overcame something and the crowd cheered you on and that's exciting, yeah. but it's a game. But overcoming things when there's no cheering, there's no crowd, there's no praise right, of that right. nature. It's something deeper. Mm. Uh, like you talk about, you know, the sending them out in the desert, you know, and just making them fight through the night, you know, with the wild animals and so forth. That whole concept, um, you know, is it, tough. And a lot of young men today, they don't have that presented to them. And, and we, our society doesn't even offer that. You know, you know, one example I think of is, you know, when I was younger, if I'd have ever said to my dad, dad, can you put me through college? And don't get me wrong. I'm not putting down parents who want to put their kids through college, but that becomes the norm for so many people. So many young people think my parents, they're just going to do that for me. My dad would have looked at me and said, I'm sorry, what did you say? Yeah. Would you put me through college? He would have said, go get three jobs and put yourself through college. I can't <laughs> afford to put you through college. Right. You know, it was that sort of a, 
you know, when he co-signed on a loan for me so I could buy my first 1969 Volkswagen Beetle. That was my first awesome. car. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. He co-signed on it. It was a $900 car. And I need, just needed a little extra backing because the bank <clears throat> didn't know who I am at 16 years old. And he said, I'll co-sign on this. He said, if you are late on one payment, I'm taking the car keys. I'm hanging them up. And you're not getting it back until you earn them back. Yeah. You know, so those types of things were, were ways that I had to really earn through something. And then when I did something good, you know, there was that moment of um, good job. Now, my dad wasn't an outspoken man, you know, God rest his soul. But it was enough to help me realize there was a rite of passage that wasn't about glory and popularity. It was about ownership and accountability. Right. And I don't see that as much today. So I agree with you very much on that. I also think there's an aspect of, of you know, I want to say to the ladies out there who are listening, watching right now. You have everything to do with helping us men be good, holy, solid, virtuous men, too. And this is the other part of the coin. I know we're not really addressing in this episode very much at all, really. But women have been attacked so much diabolically with regards to their understanding of what a woman is and their role in helping men be true men. You know, Sam, you and I would know, both of us, you know, having wives. I tell my wife all the time, you hold my heart right here in your hands with one word, one look across the room. You can crush me or you can make me feel like I can take on the world, mm -hmm. you know, and there's something powerful about that. Again, as you mentioned earlier, Sam, the complementary nature between a husband, a wife, a man and a woman, that if women have their act together as well in virtue, they can do everything to help us men find and understand what God has called us to be. Back to what you had said, Father, originally, we're, we're protectors and defenders. Adam was a protector and defender of the garden <clears throat> of the woman, Eve. That's what we're built for. And it's in our DNA. And I ask the women out there to just prayerfully remember that and help us men be what we're supposed to be. You know, I, I, I haven't been a dad, you know, I, I, except for all my children and my parishioners, you know, but, <laughs> but I, wanna, I want to um, just say a couple of good words about my dad and my parents, actually. But it, it, in this way, I want to start by saying that I have five brothers and sisters and they're all practicing Catholics, and they're all very active in the parish, and they all love God. Uh, one sister is a principal at a Catholic high school. I'm a priest. What, 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 was, what, what happened there? Well, it was because mom and dad, but I think dad especially, set in us that religion, faith, isn't just punching a clock on Sunday morning. It's seeing need and take care, taking care of it. You know, especially at the parish level, you know, we, we had a school attached to, to our parish. And so, you, you know, I had to raise money all the time, you know, all kinds of dinners and breakfasts and things. We were in the kitchen washing dishes and we were out serving tables. And uh, I remember dad had an idea, you know, let's sell light bulbs to the neighborhood. So we were knocking on doors. I don't know if they let you do that anymore, but you know, Hey, you want to buy some light bulbs? But you know, the idea was, is that there was this, this energy, this, this zeal. Uh, for wanting to to take care of need when you see it, and yeah. and uh, and that was instilled in us, and so our faith as we grew up became something uh, that was mission oriented, okay, mm -hmm. and 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 set our hearts on wanting to make this world a better better place. Mm -hmm. um, if a friend is sick, go see him. You know, if someone needs an ear, you know, listen. You know, if so, if you're standing in the grocery store and someone needs a smile do it, you know, uh, but you see need, you take care of it. That's the essence of it. And so I think for my brothers and sisters, praise God, especially our spiritual leader, my dad, you know, uh, and our family, uh, that, that, that was, that, that it made sense to us, this faith of ours. And, and so, like I say, they're all practicing to this day. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And modeling that, that service um, servant leader yeah right dad was dad was a servant leader and he said you know get behind me we're like ducklings you know behind dad I mean, take That's powerful if there's need take care of it right Ron, i think you hit a key part there father about the fact that you know service you know sam you mentioned earlier about you know strength it's not true strength if it's not for service you know one of my mottos in the weight room is train to serve don't train to be vain you know, if you're worried about your gun show, um, doesn't mean anything if they're not serving. Otherwise, you're just shooting blanks. You know, you ain't got no real guns there. 
or shooting blanks. You know, the idea is you, you build the muscle, you train mentally, spiritually, physically, whatever it is. So you're ready to get out there, roll up your sleeves yeah. and take on the hard tasks, the hard, difficult challenge that might be there. You know, we're built for that. It's in our DNA. I don't see us as men any different than the, the Knights Templar, the, the Knights of Malta, the Battle of Lepanto men, any of those men who, when they were called up to do something for the church, you know, for God, for others, they rolled up their sleeves and they did what they were asked to do. You know, we're, we're built the same, but that which surrounds us today, you know, the diabolical attacks, you know, none of them are really that, that new, maybe repackaged. Maybe there's a little more around us and how it, it, it's easier to get to some of these uh, temptations that are out there. We know that with our technology and all. But, you know, that being said, we're still built the same as men. We're built for that kind of service that, you know, you just mentioned, Father. You see a need, you get out there and take care of it. That's it, exactly. Um, Sam, uh, thank you so much for this amazing book. It's so needed right now. Is there anything as we're uh, getting ready to say uh, uh, goodbye here? Is there anything you want to leave men, you know, some, something hopeful about, you know, what can we do to, to become better as Catholic gentlemen? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would, I, I would first say, you know, if you've listened to everything that we've just said in this kind of this final segment, you're like, what can I do? You know, maybe I've never had that rite of passage or any of those things. How can I make that transition? Well, I'll just say a few things. First of all, um, get uncomfortable, do something that makes you uncomfortable. You know, a lot of men spend their whole life just trying to preserve their comfort, um, you know, and it, do something, step out into the unknown, get uncomfortable, do something risky. Maybe you're putting something off. You've always had this desire to, to do something for maybe Christ in the church or maybe just in some other way. Well, we'll do that. Step out into the unknown, face those fears. Um, okay. And then second, I would say um, realize that everything in your life, matters in one way or another. Uh, I think it was Aristotle that said, you know, we are what we repeatedly do. Right. And every day we're making choices, thousands of choices. And those are shaping who we are and who we become. They form our character. So take everything seriously. When you wake up, give that first moment of the day to the Lord. Give, you know, say a prayer. Say a prayer of consecration or, or a prayer of dedication of that day to, to, to God. And, and then make make little choices that will add up to virtuous choices someday. Virtue doesn't just happen overnight. You don't just snap your fingers and become a courageous, patient, you know, virtuous, courteous gentleman. You've got to build it piece by piece. And if you're looking at your life and you're like, man, it's chaos, it's a mess, start small. Start with those little choices. Right. They matter more than you think. So start small and start making choices that build virtue, that build self-control. Um, self-control is one of the few fruits of the spirit that's mentioned in scripture. And we build this foundation of virtue that allows grace to flourish in our lives. It's very difficult for faith, hope, and love to live in our souls uh, when we're unvirtuous at a natural level. So till that ground of your soul, so to speak, by building virtuous habits. And then finally, uh, worship and serve the Lord with all your heart. You know, yeah. what's we all have something in our life that's this kind of the sacred center of our life. Absolutely. And it informs all the other choices that we make. Right. Is that pleasure? Is that ego satisfying, you know, and self-aggrandizement? It you know, what is that? It really it should be the Lord, your God. It should be Jesus Christ, you know. It, Go to worship with dead seriousness. You know, it, it, we're dealing with eternity here. Right. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Serve him. Serve his church. You know, pour out you know, your heart before him in the Eucharist, his presence with us here in the tabernacle or, you know, at Mass. Uh, take it with dead seriousness. There's just a triteness that you feel in a lot of, uh, of modern worship. And it's, it's, it's tragic because... God himself is coming among us and we don't even care. Yeah. So, so take it seriously and bow down before the Lord. I think there's something in every man that wants to humble himself before a reality that is greater and more powerful and more transcendent Absolutely. than himself. So do that. Humble yourself before yeah. the Lord and he will bless you in ways that you can't even imagine. Yeah. Uh, commit your way to him and he will take care of you and guide your steps. So, 
Nice. I know that was a lot. I apologize, but no, no, it was awesome. Right. I just want to double down on on your last part there. Yeah, I truly believe that, guys. You know, be well connected to our Lord. You know, be in that state of grace. You know, uh, what is it? Ephesians six ten. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Right. You got to be empowered by God, and that Sam, that's what you're saying there. And, and so, you know. Uh, go to confession, you know, uh, and, and if you fall, go again. Um, I always tell guys, don't let a m- month go by without going to confession. Go right away after serious sin. Uh, b- by all means, don't have that argument with your wife if you're not in this state of grace, okay? It's not going to go well, all right? Uh, <laughs> but the point is, is that, you know, be uh, that Catholic gentleman, but know that that power comes directly from God. Uh, Sam, just an amazing book and so necessary for our times. Everybody go get this, The Catholic Gentleman at Amazon.com. And got, Father, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I got to throw in one more thing too. Sure. Um, the Blessed Mother, make her part of your life. Absolutely. Blessed Mother is a queen. She's our queen. And I love that. And I don't remember what saying who said this, that the Blessed Mother, you know, deep devotion to Mary allows Our Lady to tame the brute within exactly. the man and make him the true warrior. Yep. And we all need that. As you mentioned earlier, Sam, it's easy just to fall into these false ideas of manhood that are superficial and, and we can forget what the, what the strength is really for, the power, the influence and all this. Our Lady tames the brute behavior and will help us transform by God's grace into the true warrior for the kingdom of heaven and the salvation of souls. Pray the daily rosary. Make it part of your daily life, men. It is essential in, in helping us come closer to the, the queen of all queens, our 12-star yeah. general. Yep. You start treating our lady as a queen, you're going to treat all ladies as a queen. So yes. yes. Awesome. Awesome, Doug. Sam, thanks so much. Yeah, there yeah. he's got his statue. Awesome. Hey, where to go, Sam? <laughs> so we'll close with a prayer. And this is actually asking that we do get filled with God's grace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, you guys. This is awesome. Thanks, God Sam. Good, good to have you on the show, Sam. Thanks so much for having me. It was, it was great. Yeah, it was.